morning, everyone. Hope everyone can hear. Um, what I'd like to do, uh, if you've seen, um, this is a fairly thick study. I'm not going to uh, uh, go through all of it. Uh, and we have the mini-me version, as I call it, the executive summary, I think, on chairs. So you could uh, look at this. Uh, but I will go through, uh, I think, fairly briskly, sort of a, an outline of uh, some of the key findings, just to give everyone a sense of the, the nature of this study. Um, I want to thank the uh, American Chamber of Commerce, the EU, and its Executive Council for uh, sponsoring this. Uh, they sponsor this. They sponsor our annual series on the Translink economy. But uh, it was an independent work. Actually, we didn't even talk about uh, you know the inner details. So all of the errors are mine, unfortunately. Uh, if there's anything that you'd like to discuss, uh, um, so. The idea here was uh, keyed off of something Tom Friedman uh, wrote about 15 years ago in his book on the Lexus and the olive tree. And in that book, you know, he was talking about globalization. And he said, uh, during the Cold War, the key question was, whose side are you on? Uh, and he said, today, the key question is, who are you connected to? Uh, and it's a different question. But the question I don't think had ever been answered uh, well that I had seen, uh, especially for Europe. And so the, the approach I took was to try to map the EU's connections to 12 other world regions and to do it in terms of six kinds of economic uh, interactions. Uh, goods, services, money, uh, energy, people, and ideas. How is the EU linked to the rest of the world in these areas? Where are those ties thick and thin? And what does it say about Europe's competitive position and its sort of connected uh, position uh, as you think about the future? I think a theme here, you've got to connect to compete. Uh, and those connecting uh, strands are also two key partners for you as you uh, think about your future. Um, so you'll see uh, strengths and weaknesses of Europe. And uh, I'm, I'm not going to get into the um, current crisis, uh, uh, but I think you have to start from there. I think the question is, does Europe manage this crisis in a way that positions it for the future, or does it sort of muddle through a case-by-case -case management? And that's a problem. And of course, Europe, like the United States and some other countries, doesn't start necessarily in a good position. Uh, if you look at this chart of public sector debt and, and public sector deficits, uh, the ring of fire uh, affects many of us. Uh, and the, getting the recovery right is going to be key to any longer term uh, strategy. My point would be, unfortunately, for Europe, you have to do both of these at the same time. You've got to get the recovery right and at the same time lay the foundation for the future. When I say Europe 2020, the headline I try to advance is the following. Rising powers are resetting the global economy. No question about it. But they haven't done so yet. And the yet part is, I think, the opportunity and the challenge for Europe. Europe, in my view, looking at all these trends, has about a decade till 2020 to reposition itself for the economy that is emerging. It can use that time well, or it can squander it. Uh, and I think that what, how Europe de deals with this will determine, uh, in fact, the very nature of the EU 10 years from now, as well as Europe's uh, relative position. So just briefly through some of these flows, if, if I may, uh, just quickly. Uh, Europe's in good starts out in a very good position. Number one exporter and importer. Number one exporter to emerging markets. Number one exporter to each of the BRIC countries. Um, you know, a very competitive uh, position. It's actually maintained its world trade position, 19% of exports in the last 15 years. So it's withstood the competition of rising powers better than the United States or Japan. The US has lost a 6% share in Japan, also 6%, so that the US is now down to 12.5% and Japan only 8.6%. And the EU is remaining competitive in upmarket, high quality goods, uh, in doing better in high tech issue, uh, areas than many would acknowledge, and the medium tech quite as well. If you look at the connections, the North American market is still number one for, for the EU exporters. It's the equivalent of, in my terminology, four regions in the Asia Pacific. I should say that uh, China, India, Russia, and Japan are all, in my terminology, regions. The rest are kind of the normal regions you would think about. 
but this is Oceania, China, Rising Asia, and Japan, about the same market as North America now for goods from Europe. You see that uh, wider Europe, and this is a sub-theme through the entire study, another big, big, important market for Europe. Wider Europe is non-EU Europe. Uh, it's still quite considerable for the EU, and in fact, its share has gone up, not down. And so it's three times what EU exports to China. The EU exports more to Switzerland than it does to China. Uh, and so even though there's 30% annual growth in EU exports to China, it's from a low base. This is another theme, I think, running through the study. High growth from a very low base is not necessarily as much as low growth from a very high base. Now, if you have a very big market and you just increase marginally, you're still growing perhaps more, depends on the issue, than markets with low base. So, yes, there's big change. It'll change over the next decade considerably, but at the moment, there's still these types of relationships. I think the concern for Europe is, as you see, that the share of technology-intensive imports from China is now higher than the share of technology imports within the EU itself. Uh, China is not just sending cheap goods to Europe. It is increasingly moving up the chain and sending high research intensive and technology intensive goods to Europe. That will be challenging for European companies here. The caveat to that is many of those goods are actually being produced by European companies in China. So made in China isn't the same as made by China. And one has to make that distinction always. If you just look, I'm just going to do a quick visual here. You see the goods exports from the EU to other parts of the world. You see kind of the relationships there quickly. You see kind of how that is. That's in your uh, executive summaries. If you look at EU imports, you see how China figures as the number one partner now uh, quite considerably. And that is a trend that I'm sure it will continue. If you turn to services, we have argued for many years this is Europe's sleeping giant. It's the biggest source of untapped growth. It's the source of all net job growth in the EU. The EU is number one in the world in services as a trader. 43% of export world export share is just from the EU alone. Uh, 18 EU member states doing quite well in that area. Uh, eight of 11 categories, it's number one. The US is, has the lead in the other three. Uh, and 10% export growth a year you know, better than the global growth rate, a little less than Asia, but Asia is from a low base, doing much better than North America, 4% a year better. The EU 15, the old member states, quadrupled their trade surplus in services over the last few years, and trade surplus with everybody except the Caribbean and North America. And there's a lot of room to grow in the world in terms of services. I think often in Europe, particularly, there's a debate between manufacturing and services, which I think is a false choice because manufacturing and services industries today are increasingly intertwined, and I think that trend will grow. So the statistics, the estimates are that manufacturing pulls about 17 of its percent of its production from services today, and it pushes out about 8% of its production into the services economy. So if services win, manufacturing wins. It's not an either-or choice. Japan is the cautionary tale here. Japan, world-class manufacturing, uh, industry, no services economy. And because of that lack now, it's having a big impact on their manufacturing industries because they're unable to provide the same kind of intertwined uh, 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 packet of offerings that some other countries are doing. The, the untold story that on the charts here that but I think is critical just to keep in mind is that on good, both goods and services and investment, which I'll come to, two thirds of all of that is actually within the EU. I mean, the EU per se is the biggest market for EU member states, uh, and that's important has grown, not shrunk, over the last few years. So what the EU can do with itself as a pan-continental market is quite critical, actually. You see the relationships there, North America, uh, wider Europe, again, quite critical. If you look at the map to show the flows, here's EU exports, still very important, organic ties almost to North America, uh, and imports still quite important. Uh, as well, and services. So services is a key strength for Europe if it would tap it, but it seems to, to not quite have the ability to do that uh, for various reasons. Now here's the quick visual. So here's the goods trade balance for the EU, most of it negative. Here's the services trade balance for the EU, almost all of it positive. Uh, so services, while smaller than goods as a percentage, are growing. And it's really only the United States and the EU, plus a few other countries that are even services economies, 
It's a big strength. If you turn to money, we do various parts of money, foreign direct investment. The, part, the, the important thing about services is that companies now are going behind trade barriers elsewhere in, in emerging markets and simply investing in those countries and providing local services in the country. So investment is really critical, more critical than trade to services. And here again, the EU is really quite important as an investor. Trade itself is very misleading as a measure of commerce. It's a very limited form of commerce. It doesn't tell the full picture. I think m many popular depictions of commerce always just focus on trade. I think that leads you down the wrong road. It skews what you should think about when you think about what an economy does. And if you have to add investment. So EU, number one source and destination in the world of foreign direct investment. It's more important in most of these countries as an investor, not a trader. And it's number one in the US, number one in Japan, number one in each BRIC country. Uh, strong position. And in terms of investment. 38% of it going to North America, more than the next six uh, 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 combined. The United States is the most profitable region in the world for European companies. Last year, affiliate income, $106 billion. That's what European companies earned in the United States. Um, and you see wider Europe again, the secondary story here, always still very significant, and it's gone up its share. And if we talk about the BRIC countries, the story really is Russia and Brazil, not China and India for EU investors. Uh, Russia flows are about twice uh, the flows to China. Uh, the EU's largest assets are in Brazil, not anywhere else. Uh, but for Russia, the EU is overwhelmingly the dominant partner. 75% of the investment stock in Russia from abroad is from the EU. Uh, it's quite overwhelming, so important for Russia not as significant for, for the Europeans. And I think, this, at least for me, some, one of the surprising sub-themes here across all of these is India. The relationship is extremely thin in almost every category, really not much developed in any way. Even services, which India is sort of the services giant, some say, but my, after looking at it, it seems to me it's Indian service companies competing with EU service companies in third markets, not any bilateral relationship of any magnitude whatsoever. And uh, that's, a, at least for me, was an interesting sort of side uh, realization. If you look at what goes into the EU, the EU needs investment from abroad. Almost all of it, uh, ha almost half of it is from the United States. More than the next 20 investors combined. It's just an overwhelming uh, relationship. And, and American companies last year, despite talk of recession and uh, depression almost, earned $196 billion in Europe. Uh, more than anywhere in the world, uh, and it's a historic record earning, historically the highest volume. And the rebound last year was 30% increase back, uh, back in Europe. So American companies, despite all the doom and gloom in Europe, seem to think business can be profitable and good, and they earn more money here than anywhere else. If you look at, the again, these maps, that just shows you, again, the extreme relationship there and here. Now, if you turn to finance and portfolio investments, uh, again, you see number one uh, investor in many uh, North America, wider Europe, Russia, India, Oceania, number two, almost everywhere else, and number three, just in China. Otherwise, that covers all the other regions. You see, again, the deep integration across the Atlantic. Even after the financial crisis, the transatlantic share of almost every uh, globally relevant financial criteria is there uh, and has, has not changed too much. But the trend is toward a shrinking share. You see global stock market capitalization now, the transatlantic share is only 50%. It was 78% 10 years ago. Uh, investment banking revenue, Asia's share is growing. Still only 20%, but it's growing. So one has to keep some of these trends in mind. I think the overall, if just talking about the transatlantic piece, my conclusion is, it has moved from sort of preeminence to predominance. It's still quite striking uh, in most of these figures, but it's no longer just overwhelming in many areas. Uh, but it's still very important to Europe how this, how this works.